Hi, everyone. We're just going to wait a minute here to let the room fill up. Thank you for joining us. All right, it looks like our numbers are slowing down, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Elena Cree. I am a manager at the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, or SDSN. Uh, welcome to our webinar today, where we are uh, featuring highlights from America's Zero Carbon Action Plan, which was recently published by SDSN USA. Um, so today's session is going to focus on the industrial policy, employment, and just transition chapter of the report. Um, the Zero Carbon Action Plan was developed over the course of the last year by the Zero Carbon Consortium, which is made up of nearly 100 researchers from across the U.S., the primary mandate of the project was to articulate a detailed policy pathway to get the U.S. to reach z net zero carbon uh, by mid-century and to mitigate emissions in line with the Paris Agreement. Um, so the report itself is anchored in an intensive modeling exercise, which was done by Evolved Energy Research. Um, they used a backcasting exercise to determine the potential least cost pathway to decarbonize the most emissions intensive sectors across the US. So their least cost pathway for the transition serves as the basis on which the rest of the report is written. Um, and you can find that in chapter two of the report, which we'll put in the uh, chat here shortly. Um, so for today, uh, we're going to hear from three authors who worked specifically to illustrate the labor transitions based on the energy and infrastructure modeling work. Um, first, we're going to hear from the lead author of the chapter, Robert Pollan. He's a distinguished university professor of economics and co-director of the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, and Professor Pollan's going to give us a background on the methodology used and the results for the American workforce, um, including what the transition might look like for our fossil fuel industry workers. Uh, then we're going to hear from Ellen Scully-Russ, Associate Professor of Human and Organizational Learning at the George Washington University. Um, and she's going to cover workforce development education and training programs that are needed to facilitate the transition. And then finally, we'll hear from Janet wicks Lim, Associate Research Professor at the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, who's going to talk about the tools needed for achieving equitable access to high quality jobs related to the transition. So before we begin, um, I'd like to let everyone know that this webinar is being recorded and will be available later today on the ZCAP website. Um, so both the recording and actually the slides that you're seeing will be available there and we'll put the link in shortly. Um, and then finally, also mentioning, we're going to have a Q&A session toward the end of the presentations. Um, we ask that you use the Q&A box in the Zoom platform to enter your questions throughout the presentations. And then we're going to ask the, uh, the presenters to address them in the end. Um, so without further ado, uh, Professor Poland, would you like to turn on your camera and join us, mm -hmm. get us started? Yes, thank you very much, um, Elena. And I also want to thank uh, the other organizers of this project and managers. That was Elena and Cheyenne Maddox and, of course, Jeff Sachs. And I uh, appreciate the opportunity to work with them and with a very large team of co workers on this chapter. I'm very happy to have Ellen Scully Russ and Jeanette Wicks Lim as presenters, but there were, if you read the chapter, you'll see a lot of other names as contributing in various ways. I will just point out one in particular, and that's my coworker here at UMass, Shovik Chakraborty. So uh, our chapter, as uh, Elena said, 
wants to look at the, uh, well, just transition in general, but we wanna look at the employment effects of this model that's developed in chapter two of this large study uh, by uh, uh, Jim Williams and Ryan Jones uh, that shows the pathway through which the US economy can get to net zero emissions by 2050. So that is gonna entail a lot of investments in clean energy activities, uh, such as solar power, such as wind power, such as electric vehicles, such as more efficient H, uh, heating, ventilating and air conditioning systems. And so that's gonna create a lot of jobs. So we're gonna show the impact on employment of what it takes to get to the zero uh, emissions goal by 2050. And by the same token, as Elena says, there will be people who are gonna be hurt because they're, they're dependent on the fossil fuel economy now. So we're gonna look at the impact on jobs um, for the fossil fuel economy and we're gonna describe uh, a just transition for them and briefly also talk about the impact on communities. And before I dive into the numbers, which I will in one second, I wanna say that overall finding the magnitude of the job creation from the clean energy investments, it massively swamps the job losses that will happen in the fossil fuel industry. And that's a thing that we can really work with. That means we can create a lot of good jobs and we can, we can take care of all the people and the communities that will be hurt. So let's go into the numbers. So first slide. So very briefly, as Elena said, I'll, I'm not gonna go into all the details, but I want you to understand that these numbers that we come out with, you know, they're not just coming out of nowhere. Uh, we have a methodology. The basic source of data is uh, input output tables, uh, which are basically organizing all the uh, information on economic activity by every enterprise in the US economy. And uh, we are able to, uh, out of that uh, set of data, we're able to see uh, how much employment gets created through any activity in the economy, not just clean energy, not just fossil fuel, any activity. And uh, that's our basic source of these results, what we call employment output ratios. And we get, job creation through three channels. Uh, what we call direct jobs, meaning if you're building an electric vehicle, um, how many people are there at the assembly plant building the vehicle? Uh, secondly, indirect jobs. Uh, those are what we would call supply chain jobs, meaning if we're building electric vehicles, well, first we have to produce steel, we have to produce glass, we have to produce rubber, tires. So those would be indirect jobs. Uh, or in other words, supply chain jobs. And the third is multiplier, induced jobs, which are multiplier effects. And that's basic stuff from intro macroeconomics, meaning that when you create the direct and indirect jobs, those people have incomes, they have money in their pockets, they go out and spend it. And that creates more jobs in turn. So that creates jobs for people serving lunch uh, to the people in the, in the plant building the electric vehicle, for example. Okay, next slide, please. So uh, how do we get differences in job creation? Um, the first thing is what we call labor intensity. How many people are working at a given uh, work site as opposed to how much is being spent on everything else? For example, on buildings, on equipment, on energy. Uh, the second thing is how much do you pay people? So we obviously are concerned with the quality of jobs, but when you pay more and you have a given budget, well, then you will get fewer jobs. So compensation is the third thing, second thing. And then the third thing is domestic content. So if we're building electric vehicles, say in Michigan, uh, what percentage of all the supply chain um, products are, domestically produced versus imported. And I'll show you in a second, we try to control uh, for varying that domestic content under the premise that we want to expand domestic content and get more jobs. So this is how we uh, generate our job estimates. It really has nothing to do with green jobs per se or dirty jobs per se. It's number of jobs through spending money 
to produce anything in any activity. Okay, next. Um, so when we do this, we have to, uh, we work from the Williams-Jones model to establish uh, what the clean energy activities are within the framework of the input output model. That actually took by far the most time of anything else. That took actually months. Uh, uh, it doesn't show, but it took a long time. Uh, secondly, we're looking at a framework of getting to uh, zero emissions by 2050. So the information we have on how you produce an electric vehicle today is not gonna be the same as how you produce an electric vehicle in 2042 or 2047. So we have to incorporate, we have to make some assumptions about how much the production methods are gonna change over time, and we do. And then the third thing, as I've already mentioned, we aren't just interested in jobs. We want them to be good jobs. And so we focus on job quality in terms of wages, benefits, opportunities for training, equal access, and uh, Ellen and um, Jeanette are gonna give us a lot of useful perspective on those things. Okay, next. So here's the basic finding that we came up with in terms of the working with the Williams-Jones model to get us to net zero by 2050. And we're now we're looking at uh, the average number of jobs created year to year 2020 to 2050 uh, to achieve this outcome. And you can see we've broken it down in terms of direct, indirect jobs. Uh, and then in the last two columns, we include the induced jobs, the multiplier effects. And we, we estimate these numbers in two ways, assuming that the percentage of imports is exactly what it is right now, is our first set of columns, and then we assume, well, let's say we can uh, run this clean energy transition with 100% domestic content. How much difference would that make in terms of jobs? So uh, what you can see here is that these are our basic results. The basic finding is direct and indirect jobs. We're gonna get between 2.3 and 2. million jobs. Okay, uh, we raise from 2.3 to 2.7 when we increase domestic content when we reduce imports. And then if we add the induced jobs, the multiplier effects, the spending money from these people who have jobs, we're up to about four and a half million jobs. So depending on your definition, we're looking at job creation on an average annual basis of between two and a half and four and a half million jobs through this project. As you can see here, we look at it relative to the size of the labor force. So it's about one and a half percent of the labor force up to about two and a half percent of the labor force. This is from this clean energy project. So the idea that, you know, when you build a clean energy economy, you're gonna sacrifice jobs, quite the contrary, we're gonna create millions of jobs. Next. Okay, but there will be job losses, and this is very important, and we spend a lot of time focusing on that. And we look at the job losses in terms of two time periods, the 21 to 2030 time period, and then 2031 uh, to 2050. Why? Because in the Williams-Jones model, the major contraction in fossil fuels happens in these two phases. 2021 to 2030, basically we phase out coal and we keep most of the uh, oil and gas operations going. And then in 2031 to 2050, we phase out most, but not entirely oil and gas. Now here's the, the critical measures here. What we see is uh, this is the total workforce as of 2018 in fossil fuels. It's two and a half million people of which 151,000 are in coal mining and related activities, oil and gas, 2.3 million. And the exercise we do though, over this period, 20 to 21 to 2030, we say, okay, on an average annual basis, we're gonna lose 10% of those jobs. And then we say, yes, but with demographically, 
Some of the workers who are now employed are going to retirement, uh, voluntary retirement. So when we combine the year to year job losses and, uh, and then weigh that against the voluntary retirements, what we end up in this first phase, 21, 20 to, uh, 2021 to 2030, we net out 12,000 jobs loss in coal mining and no job losses in oil and gas. Again, most of the job losses in oil and gas are gonna come in the second phase. But just to emphasize for right now, 12,000 job losses in coal and related activities weighed against the 4 million jobs per year on average that are gonna be coming out of the clean energy project. Next slide. Yeah, okay. So now we're looking at the 2130 to 2050 period and we do the same exercise for oil and gas, uh, 21, uh, 2031 to 2050, we take into account annual job losses now over a 20 year period. And we also take into account the fact that some workers are gonna come to retirement age and voluntarily retire. We do not assume everybody chooses to retire. We do uh, incorporate information, the data that we have on the percentage of voluntary retirements. Anyway, what we come out with in this second phase is about 34,000 jobs lost per year. Again, 34,000 jobs lost per year in the phase two with the contraction of oil and gas relative to 4 million jobs on average being created. Okay, next slide. So what we are uh, very focused on, the numbers aren't large, right? It's about 12,000 people losing their jobs per year in phase one and about 34,000 in phase two. We wanna make sure each and every one of those workers has a just transition. And we define a just transition in terms of these three critical features, income support, retraining, which Ellen is gonna talk about more, and relocation. Income support, we assume that anybody who loses their job is going to move into a new job and at least earn the same wage. If the new job doesn't pay the same, the government program will uh, make them whole. Retraining, I'll leave that to Ellen, but this is obviously if people need to move into new employment areas, especially in this rapidly expanding clean energy economy, they need to have the skills. And then relocation, we assume some people have to move. Anyway, when you add those up, what we're looking at in phase one, 2021 to 2030, a uh, billion and a half dollars per year total. And in the phase two, 3.8 billion total. Now these numbers, when you say billion, sometimes it sounds like a big number. This is less than one one hundredth of 1% of the average GDP over these periods. These are trivial amounts that can go to supporting the workers that are gonna face displacement through this necessary clean energy transition. It's a critical project. Okay, next fit, next slide, please. Uh, the next thing we also wanna look at the impact on communities because there will be uh, not only the jobs lost in the people, but we are going to see impacts on communities. And again, uh, these impacts matter a lot in the specific communities, but they are a very small and concentrated number of communities and so that within those communities, we can think about disproportionate support in terms of clean energy, in terms of land reclamation and repurposing projects. So just to give you a sense of it, what we have here, these are the states in the United States with 3000 or more employees in coal. So 3000 is again, a trivial number and there's only five states where there's more than 3,000 people working in the industry. And as you can see, there's only two states, West Virginia and Wyoming, in which these, this share at constitutes more than 1% of the labor force. So again, we can target West Virginia, Wyoming, and the other states to support them in terms of land reclamation repurposing. Okay, next. And then the same story here with oil and gas. Of course, oil and gas is a much bigger industry. 
But even still, what we show here are the share of states with 15,000 or more employees in 2019. And as you can see, it's uh, only seven states. And there's only, uh, let's say, more than these uh, one, two, three, four, five that are over 3% of the uh, workforce. So uh, yes, it's going to be a major transition in these states, no doubt. But these are manageable numbers. And again, it's something that we can focus on and deliver a just transition in these regions. Next. Okay, so then we want to look at job quality. I can't go through all of it, but I just want to give you a, a broad sense. First, uh, critically uh, in compensation, what we're looking at, and I'm just considering these three areas, uh, invest activity in vehicles, electric vehicles, HVAC equipment and refrigeration. And we're looking at a range of about 70 to $80,000 per year. Uh, I have these other data, you can see it in the paper, but let's just focus on that for now. Yeah, next, next slide. And then uh, we also look at uh, other features, including educational levels and, and critically what we are also concerned about and what Jeanette's gonna talk about more is the uh, representation in terms of communities, people of color and percent female. And the percentage of, in terms of people of color is about at the national average, uh, but we wanna expand those opportunities. But in particular, the percentage of female employment in clean energy is uh, extremely low. And so we want to, uh, if we're building up this economy, the clean energy economy, we have to open it up for people of color and females. Next, please. Now let's compare that with fossil fuels. And this is critical, just on compensation. Fossil fuel average wage is almost 110,000. You saw it was like 70,000 uh, with the clean energy. So let's acknowledge that these jobs right now are better jobs by wages. Uh, and so that when we talk about this transition, we have to recognize, yes, it's not a lot, large number of people that are going to lose their jobs, you know, 12,000, 30,000, but they're pretty good jobs. And so that if we're transitioning them into other things, we have to acknowledge this and make sure these people are made whole. That is the principle behind the just transition. In terms of the uh, communities of color and female, the profile is about the same. It's not any better in the fossil fuel economy. We have to make it better in the clean energy economy uh, in order to this be a just transition for all people having access to these new opportunities. Next, please. So uh, finally, I'll just end on this and then turn it to Ellen. Uh, there's some interesting survey evidence done on uh, in the expansion of the clean energy economy, there are new skills uh, that people need to be able to be comfortable with. And uh, according to this survey data that was done of firms that are hiring in these areas of energy efficiency, solar electricity, and wind electricity, we have a very high proportion of employers saying that they actually have a hard time finding qualified people. Uh, as you can see, these numbers uh, are 70, 80%. Uh, are saying that they're having a hard time finding people. Now, maybe you say, well, that's the employers, they just like to complain, maybe, but these are still significant numbers and they reflect the fact that part of this transition is creating a lot of new opportunities in new activities and people need to have the training to get to move themselves into these activities. And we have to open up these activities for people of color and women. And we have to make sure that the wages are going to be commensurate uh, with what people deserve. And that's the role uh, that we're going to talk about next in Ellen and Jeanette's presentations. Thanks.
Thank you, Bob. Um, Ellen, do you want to turn on your camera and mic and join us? I know we are having a little bit of technical. Up, oh, you're muted. Sorry, dear. Hello, can you hear me? Ah, uh, yes, you can. You sound good. Thank you. Um, Welcome. Uh, good. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, pleasure to to join you here today. I'm going to share a little bit about uh, about my work in workforce development. Uh, I also had the opportunity to uh, conduct a couple of case studies of the of two energy training partnerships funded under the Obama administration, and, and uh, have some lessons learned from from those studies that I'd like to that I'd like to share. Uh, first, I, I just really want to contextualize. Um, this conversation in where where I think um, the policy and the politics might might be these days related to to this issue. Um, we saw in 2009 a, a flurry of activity under the Obama administration, as we all know, big investments in in the green industry. Some based on uh, some of the assumptions that Robert just shared, um, and other assumptions that um, were were. Uh, economic assumptions and goals that were were present at the time. Um, all of that, as we know, died under the Trump administration. Um, but we can rest assured and pretty much bet that in the Build Back Better uh, agenda of Obama and uh, excuse me of um, Biden and Harris, we're gonna we're gonna see um, equal, if not more, investment in this area uh, as well as the training. So I think um, I think the lessons learned from the last time are. Are very important um, because I think they're going to be part of the part of the story and part of the narrative. Um, so we can see that the magnitude of the investments, including the investments in education and training, over one billion across the administration, uh, in various programs and various agencies, specifically 500 million for energy training partnerships coming out of the Department of Labor to actually fund um, regional partnerships in the green energy sector uh, to be providing a job training and wraparound services to help workers uh, move into uh, green jobs as they became available. Um, simultaneously, or a few years later, we saw um, a lot of bad press related to these investments. Um, many of the firms that received large amounts of economic um, uh, 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 investments of millions of dollars, many of them closed, as you might remember, um, because they just could not get the, their business off, businesses off the ground. Um, the energy trading partnerships uh, did not perform well uh, via the EDOL uh, criteria. Um, you know, they did not train a year. Or they they were able to train many of the people that they set out to train, but they couldn't place them um, in in green jobs, and so therefore they were out of compliance with a lot of their their performance measures. Um, and that was across the board. That wasn't just some of the partnerships. Many of them were having those issues. Um, and so, if you if you if you Google, you know, the Obama Green Jobs Initiative, you're gonna you're gonna see things like in the headlines, failure, slow to sprout. Um, and that was the case. That was the case. Um, and and I think that there are some systemic reasons for that that we can can learn from in this uh, particular cycle of green jobs um, investment. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, so based on that uh, particular scenario, as well as other um, challenges, uh, the, the, con the context today uh, is that we're living with the legacy of some of the problems in the past, where many of the assumptions around the scale and magnitude of the green economy uh, never materialized. Uh, the green economy, as predicted back then, was not brought to scale. Um, many of the, the the investments in, say, for example, weatherization, um, skills development for the weatherization um, um, efforts coming out of the construction industry, the consumer demand never really picked it up. Uh, so you had a bunch of folks who were trained in weatherization skills, but when they weren't when they weren't put to work in weatherization projects. Um, they had nowhere else to go uh, because they were only trained in weatherization skills. They weren't trained in something broader um, that could uh, be leveraged for other work, for example, in the construction industry. Um, we also didn't factor in the fact that many of the other industries that were being invested in 
uh, such as manufacturing and housing, for example, were really hit hard by the recession. So there's obviously lots of unanticipated events that could um, really interfere with some of the, the training plans and targets that, that um, you, you'll see in a minute why I'm spending some time on this because these are variables that are so important when planning education and training programs and asking people to make the risky investment of time uh, and money in training um, where there's really no job there yet. Um, so so um, we see that, for example, in the clean energy in, in investments, the conversion projects are great, uh, but unless there's something um, to follow on that actual conversion work um, and um, new, new uh, jobs and new industries taking hold, um, those skilled trade jobs that were involved in the rec in the conversion work um, will soon go away, and there's not much to replace them. Um, many green jobs require a large measure of education and skill, real foundational skills that many of the folks who will be coming out of the um, fossil fuel sector do not have, um, and yet our education and training investments um, do not allow for the long-term training that many of them are going to need. So, and then the uncertainty, this is a big finding in my, in my case study work in speaking with employers. They really wanted to continue in, you know, moving forward in their plans to move into the green job sector. But the broader regulatory environment was so uncertain that it made their own personal investments really, really risky. Um, and so um, the fact that we didn't have, for example, standardized tax incentives that, had to, that were sort of a matter of law, um, that they were only in place for a couple of years really made uh, some of the solar folks really, really sort of gun shy. Um, not being able to pick a winner between sun and wind um, was also a big problem uh, in some of the regions where where these partnerships were were taking hold. So, so I guess my point is here: um, these contextual challenges really matter. Um, next slide, please. Um, because in many efforts that we saw, especially with the ETP and other industries that are presumed to be growing or on the verge of growing, um, a lot of the trading investments are just out ahead of the job. Um, and that's problematic uh, because the programs uh, get geared up for a variety of different uh, kinds of um, presumed training needs. Um, people are recruited and they're trained um, and then they have nowhere to go. Um, and, and that's very disheartening for, for the learner uh, and the worker, uh, but it also is very frustrating for the training provider uh, because um, they've geared up to do, to do something that just doesn't work out. And so you have the legacy of this problem in many of the communities that receive green job investment. And that in and of itself is going to be, I think, um, um, something that needs to be factored in in terms of really mobilizing efforts around, around the just transition agenda, particularly when it comes to training. Um, the other real challenge that I think many of us who do work in workforce development in the United States know is that the actual workforce development system itself, the education and training system, is quite disjointed and very... Um, sort of scattered in terms of its ability to um, actually respond to opportunities in a growing or shrinking economy uh, on the regional, state, regional, local level. Um, we have a real mixed bag when it comes to the capacity of communities to respond quickly um, and effectively to a shifting um, skills mix in, in the economic uh, arena. And the, and the emerging jobs. Uh, and so absent um, some real policy interventions to address that problem, um, um, it's particularly in the communities that we had targeted here, um, the training challenge is going to be um, very, very difficult to, to address. Um, I think another thing that we want to acknowledge is that the workforce development system and the adult ed system in this country really is in need of a total rehaul on the policy and programmatic level. Um, they, we do not invest in, in long-term training and education for adults and for workers. 
um, there are very few opportunities for workers to learn on a continuous basis while they earn. Um, apprenticeship is a great model for that, um, but it hasn't really been you know, taken up outside of the construction industry in any systematic way. Um, there are many other ways and models out there. Again, they're not, they're not really very um, widespread. And I think if you really want to talk about a just transition for people who have had um, decent jobs um, in the fossil fuel industry, we're going to have to figure out how to um, allow for them to continue to work um, in, a, in a meaningful job while they, while they, it's not for them going to work um, for them personally, emotionally, um, uh, socially, for them to step out of the workforce for however long it's going to take for them to develop, you know, the new skills that they need. Um, then, then, then to find a job. Um, I think we need to make it seamless for them. Um, and, and I think we could also see that the learning would be enhanced and, um, and expedited if that were the case. Um, and, and two other things I want to say about the change, the training challenge is, is our methodology for actually workforce planning on any level of the system that you want to talk about, local, um, regional, industrial, um, uh, state, or national, um, just really can't keep up with the demand of a rapidly changing economy. You know, sort of um, workforce development plans are often based on a series of assumptions, not unlike economic assumptions, not unlike what we what we hear um, in, in this particular plan. They're solid assumptions, um, but when we get down on the ground, and we really see how um, how these various jobs morph and change, and and, and when and how they um, actually appear and disappear. Um, it's very very complicated. Um, and so to take sort of higher level predictions and assumptions uh, and bring them down to the local level, it doesn't work in that way. I think we have to work from the top down and the bottom up. We really have to have methodologies that allow for us to account for um, a, a wide range of variables that really matter for the supply and the demand of skilled labor um, in any given area. Um, and, um, and to think about it more sort of cyclical and nonlinear than, okay, we're going to do this assessment of the job here. Then we're going to pass that information over to the educators. They're going to develop a curriculum and a certification regime. And then they're going to start training workers and workers are going to get certified and then we'll place them. That's how we think about job training today. That doesn't work in a rapidly changing, evolving, um, complicated transition such as the one that we've um, outlined here. Um, so we really do, I think, need to get smarter about the workforce planning um, and training methodologies that we use. We need to get out into firms, talk to employers, involve unions, involve workers, involve educators, um, all at the same time. Uh, to really think about how to make sense of the changes that are going on, what are the immediate skill needs, what are the longer skill needs, and start addressing the longer skill needs now. Um, uh, we have a window of opportunity where the predictions are that we really won't be seeing a lot of job loss until 19, uh, 18, uh, 20, 30, 31. Um, we should be working now in those communities to build robust workforce development systems to improve the K-12 through system. Uh, to develop more alignment between K through 12 to the workforce development systems of the adult education system, um, so that the workforce is prepared um, moving into 19, uh, excuse me, 2031 um, with the basic skills that they need to learn any of the technical skills required of the new jobs that may replace the fossil fuel jobs in those communities. So we really have to think about community interventions rather than training interventions at this particular point in time, because training will result from that, from that understanding. But if we lead with we're trying to develop training, we're going to get so bogged down in the tasks that we're training people for that we're going to lose sight of the bigger picture and the dynamics that are creating the need for an ongoing new skill formation system in the first place. Um, so, so really the point is here, you know, training is not the silver bullet. Yes, people are going to need training and they're going to need retraining. They're going to need certification. But there's so much more work that needs to go into making those programs 
um, and strategies effective. Um, and the good news is that we have some time to do it now. Um, but I think it's going to require an all-out effort with that being the focus in mind from the start rather than thinking about it come sort of late 20s, right before the, the real need hit. Um, so next slide, please. So the um, so lessons learned from, from my research of the employment um, of the ECT program is that um, um, training helps. But what really moved the dime on the, on the job quality and the job creation was that the employers actually developed new work systems based on high quality jobs and, and high skill standards. Um, then they were ready. To hey, Alan, if, if you the, could do like one more minute, sorry to interrupt you, uh, just uh, conscious of time here, but thank you. Sure. And then build and build from the uh, build from the ground up. Um, so I think I can I can stop there and um, thank you thank you for your interest and attention. Thank you, Ellen. So sorry to interrupt you there. Uh, just making sure that we have time for our last speaker and a few questions. That. I appreciate that. No problem. Thank you, uh, Jeanette. Would you like to join us? The floor is yours. Hi. Great. Thank you. Can you all hear me and see me? Yes, you sound good. Great. Okay, so um, in my portion of this presentation, I'll be speaking about institutions and policy tools that can help ensure that the employment generated from the Zero Carbon Action Plan will be high quality and that access to these high quality jobs is equitable. Um, you know, these are important considerations, particularly given the persistent disparities in the US labor market by gender and race. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, for example, we can see this in today's rates of unemployment. Uh, these, uh, the numbers that you see on the slide are from the latest report from the Department of Labor, their latest jobs report that came out last Friday. In the top panel of the slide, we can see how the unemployment rates among black men and women are much higher and have increased much more over the duration of the COVID pandemic than their white counterparts. The unemployment rates among black men and women range between nine and 12% this past October, compared to about 6% among white men and women. Moreover, the unemployment rates among black men and women rose by about four to six percentage points over the past year, compared to about 3%, um, three percentage points among white men and women. Additionally, um, as you can see in the lower half of this um, slide, you can see the fall off, the recent fall off in labor force participation rates. And that's the share of people who are active in the labor force, either working or looking for jobs. And this fall off has been notably greater for black men and women in, as well for um, white women as compared to white men. We can see um, in the bottom panel of the slide that the fall offs um, are uh, significant for those three groups I just named. and. Uh, it's important to note that these fall offs in labor force participation rate, that is the rate of workers who are um, dropping out of the labor force, really have the effect of obscuring how troubled the unemployment situation is. So as just Bob described earlier, um, the zero uh, carbon action plan has the potential to create directly in, and indirectly in the range of 2.5 million um, plus jobs. Um, we also know that the average compensation, um, including pay and benefits of these jobs will range widely and that these newly created jobs will tend to have lower average compensation levels than the jobs lost from the fossil fuel related sectors. Finally, we also know that women are substantially underrepresented among the types of jobs created across the spending and investment areas of the zero carbon action plan. So achieving equitable access and high quality jobs through the zero carbon action plan will require uh, serious focus from policymakers. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So this brings me to labor unions and labor standards. Um, having institutions in place to promote good pay and decent working conditions will help determine whether the investments and spending related to the zero carbon action plan will generate high quality jobs. We know this from past experience um, that uh, labor unions and labor standards can serve this role. This is illustrated by the findings of a 2014 study um, titled Environmental and Economic Benefits of Building Soul in California, a study by economist Peter Phillips of Utah University. In this study, he compared the contrasting situations in Arizona and California with regard to the quality of utility scale solar installation jobs. Phillips observed that in California, utility scale solar installation um, 
sorry, utility scale solar installations typically generated high quality jobs with good pay, benefits, and career ladders. In Arizona, similar solar installations typically generated jobs with low pay, few benefits, and high turnover. And what he concluded from his study is that these different outcomes were related to a combination of complementary labor market institutions that existed in each state. So first, there's the issue of union density. In California, high union density amongst construction craft workers raised the quality of construction jobs in general. And this was not the case in Arizona where union density was low. Phillips attributed this in part to Arizona's right to work law, a state policy that tends to weaken the strength of unions and a law that California has not adopted. Next, there are prevailing wage laws. Uh, prevailing wage laws basically establish the minimum wage rates that can be paid on publicly funded construction projects. All states are covered by a prevailing wage law, which requires that federally funded construction pro projects pay what prevails in the local labor market. What this meant is that in California, due to its high union density in construction crafts, prevailing wages effectively meant union negotiated pay levels were adopted in federally funded projects. And in contrast, in Arizona, due to its low union density in construction crafts, non-union pay levels instead, instead prevailed, including in the utility scale solar installations that Phillips observed. So in other words, labor standards such as prevailing wage laws reinforce the ability of unions to push employers to take a high road approach to their employment policies. And I also want to clarify here that while this research focuses on the role of traditional unions, other worker um, organization, organizations such as worker centers and worker collectives, um, those can also serve the same role alongside um, traditional unions. Okay, next slide, please. Next, I'll turn to the issue of achieving equitable access. So the underrepresentation of women among the jobs we estimate um, will be generate, that will be generated by the Zero Carbon Action Plan is in part driven by the fact that a substantial share of these jobs are in construction occupations. For example, according to our estimates, construction employment accounts for about 28% of the jobs created in the primary areas of clean renewable energy, including solar and wind, and about 26% of the jobs created by spending on heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems. And construction jobs tend to be held predominantly by men. Additionally, black workers, men or women, tend to be underrepresented in these occupations. Currently, across the US, women make up only 3.5% of construction workers, even while women represent nearly half of all employed workers. Similarly, black workers make up 13% of all employed workers throughout the US economy, but hold only 8% of construction industry jobs. So to ensure that the jobs generated by the Zero Carbon Action Plan, uh, particularly construction jobs are accessible to women and communities of color, this will require employment policies that both prohibit discriminatory behavior and require employers to take affirmative action to diversify their workforces. Now we know from past economic research that affirmative action policies have led to measurable improvements in diversifying workforces. And one of the most prominent examples of affirmative action policies are those required by Executive Order 11246. Executive 11246 requires employers with large federal contracts or federal assistance to work toward employment equity. Specifically, these employers are required to develop affirmative action plans for achieving employment utilization goals with regard to non-white and women workers. These goals are generally equal to the employment shares of qualified workers available in the local labor market. These employers must further demonstrate good faith effort to eliminate cases of underutilization. Now, the construction industry has been particularly challenging to diversify, and this challenge is actually reflected in the executive orders requirements for the construction industry specifically. This is a national um, goal for the construction industry of only 6.9% for women, for, women um, for federal construction contractors. In any case, um, employers who fail to follow through on these affirm affirmative action policies run the risk of their contracts being canceled, being disqualified from bidding on future federal contracts and also legal action by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. This past research has identified two factors that tend to increase the success of such affirmative action policies. These are um, first active enforcement, that is in the case of Executive 11246, a well-functioning and well-funded Office of Federal Contract Compliance Program, also called the OFCCP. And second, favorable labor market conditions, that is expanding employment, so that the workforce can be diversified by adding new workers, rather than displacing existing ones. 
As a result, the affirmative action policies linked to federal funds that support that will support the zero carbon action plan may be particularly effective in promoting equitable access, especially if there is a robust OFCCP operating within the context of expanding employment. Okay, thanks. That's uh, it for me and send it back to Bob. Um, so I think we'll just go right to the questions. Absolutely, thank you. And thank you to Nanette for being very concise and very quick. That was a lot of information really quickly. Um, so we do have a few questions in our Q&A box. Um, the first few are more technical on the actual uh, modeling work. So first we'll start off, Aaron Mayfield asked about how we determined the age distribution of the fossil fuel labor force um, to determine the retirement estimates that we included. I'm gonna let Jeanette answer that. Sure. So what we did was we matched the um, industry composition of the fossil fuel sector, the fossil fuel sectors and the related activities to data from the current population survey. It's a household survey conducted by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, and, you know, it collects all kinds of data on the workforce and demographic characteristics. So we matched up what we um, knew about the jobs that existed in fossil fuel sectors to this household survey data on demographics and we're able to break out what the age composition of those workers are that way. Um, does that answer the question? I think so, uh, thank you for that. And then another question on the uh, methodology. So what technologies specifically are covered in the analysis? Um, specifically is hydrogen covered? Oh, absolutely. So uh, as I mentioned, we worked from the model of uh, uh, Jim Williams and Ryan Jones. And yes, every conceivable technology in, that is in the realm of clean energy, both on the supply side, meaning solar, wind, geothermal, and so forth, and on the demand side, meaning electric vehicles, uh, heat pumps, uh, lighting systems, and so forth. Um, it is an extremely detailed model. What is remarkable in their chapter is they were able to synthesize and give you the basic story. I don't remember exactly how many lines are in the model. 8,000? Uh, really? So yes, absolutely. Hydrogen is in there. And I'll also add, Bob, to we have a, a detailed appendix specifically for this chapter, and I believe there is an, a comprehensive list of the sectors that are included that are in that That's appendix. Right. So in, in our, the chapter, our chapter, chapter three, there's a, an appendix in which we, because we grouped their, their line by line into broader categories. So we literally go through every single uh, type of investment that they include in their model, and we show how we group them. Um, and so we have another question from Diane Sachs. Um, she asked about how many of the fossil fuel workers have lost their jobs during 2020. And I assume this is potentially rated, related to the, the COVID situation currently. That I do not know. Uh, do you know, Jeanette? I, I don't. Um, I don't. I mean, you know, we, the sectors that we know have been hit the hardest are, you know, the sectors like you know, restaurants and service, yet other types of service industries, but yeah, I can't, I can't say. I mean, it is true that the oil industry and I mean, the, oil, the gas industry, for example, in, um, in Pennsylvania, the fracking are in a massive slump, mm -hmm. uh, not because of the clean transition, but because of the broader macroeconomic uh, Right. Um, and Dennis King is asking about the incoming Biden administration um, and if we've been in contact with them regarding the transition issues. Uh, well, I personally have, um, let's say, informally, but not any formal uh, contact, maybe other people on this broader project, for example, Jeff Sachs and Elena have, but uh, no, my answer is no. I don't know, Ellen, have you? No, okay. Yeah, and I, I guess I'll take that too. Uh, Dennis, we have been in touch with uh, the transition team a little bit and we're hoping to work with them more closely in the coming months. So hopefully, and we'll see. 
All right. Uh, thank you, Brad. Brad seemed to put in a, um, a figure about the decline in the fossil fuel workers. And he says, according to the labor statistics, around 90,000 um, at the end of, uh, from the end of 2019 through August, 2020. Okay. Great. So I don't see any other questions coming in at this time. Hopefully I'm not missing any. All right. Well, thank you to our speakers for joining us and for participating these last several very long months um, on doing this really intensive calculation for us and trying to project the impacts of the transition. Um, we also actually have several of other upcoming webinars. The report itself is around 400 pages. Um, so instead of trying to pack all of the details into a single event, uh, we have a series underway. So later this week, we're gonna have a discussion with our more legal and federal administration team talking about the policy and implementation plan to take the plan forward and to take some of the lessons learned that have been articulated here. How do we integrate those into to the national and state policy planning protocols. Um, and then later in the next two weeks, we're gonna have three separate webinars from our sector groups. Um, so we had a chapter on food and land use, um, materials, which is primarily our plastics industry and management in the country, and industry, which is really focused on our steel and cement manufacturing industries and how we can facilitate decarbonization there. So if you're interested or have colleagues that may be, please tune in um, and then please go download the report and share it widely. Great. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank Have a you. wonderful day. Okay. Bye. Thanks.